Evil kings doing evil things. Ha! Hey, he wasn't a king. Yeah, you're right. While some of the guys on this list weren't kings by title, they held very high positions of power nonetheless. So, to you I say... <laughs> Moving on. Emperor Nero Claudius Caesar Augustus Germanicus, or just Nero to his friends and enemies, was the very last Roman emperor of the less than impressive Julio-Claudian dynasty, which lasted from 27 BC to 68 AD. Like any complete psycho, Nero had a pretty complicated childhood. When Nero was just a wee Nerite at the age of three, his daddy went and abandoned the family by dying. <gasps> Mom got exiled to a tiny island for maybe attempting to kill Emperor Caligula. Caligula got killed anyway. Mom is unexiled and marries the new emperor, Claudius, which happens to be her uncle, by the way. The public is all, ugh. And now little Nero has a great uncle emperor dad who has proclaimed him to be the new heir to the throne. I love you, Uncle Daddy. That's a lot to deal with as a child, but the sweet birthday presents help you quickly forget. So why did this happen? because Nero's mom, Agrippina, was a political savage. Her only interest was power. So much so that, to prevent a revenge plot, she had the recently stabbed Emperor Caligula's widow accused of black magic, banished, and even convinced her to fully deplete her own health bar. Now, she wants her baby boy Nero to be emperor, and in 54 AD, that's what happened. Emperor Claudius died under mysterious circumstances. Mysterious in the sense of having a potentially poisonous mushroom just absolutely slammed down his gullet by Agrippina herself. Maybe. But since the board game Clue had yet to be invented, forensic puzzle solving was pretty minimal. Oh my god! Put that knife down! Someone's just been murdered! Coincidentally, Nero's stepbrother, Britannicus, who had claim to the throne, also decided to expire around the same time under mysterious circumstances. So now, at just 16 years old, Nero is emperor. Yes! Yes! So how did he do being emperor? He actually started off pretty well. He banned capital punishment, expanded the arts, gave disaster relief aid to neighboring cities, reduced taxes, and even gave some rights to slaves. Seems like a pretty nice guy, actually. Uh-oh, this is getting clickbaity. We're already two minutes in, where's all the evil stuff? Well, for one, he married his stepsister as a power move, which is gross, but not evil. Since the relationship was void of any real love, Nero started poking around, in other women's hoo-hahs, one of which was Papea Sabina, a local town babe who was already married. Well, Nero pops Papea and puts a baby in her belly. This little stunt ticked off his mom, who was trying to maximize power through having a mentally stable emperor's son. Since Nero didn't think that his mom's attitude was very cash money of her, he had her assassinated, but made it look like an accident. This is regarded as the turning point in Nero's reign and when all the ancient shit started to hit the ancient fan. He began going a bit mm, kill happy. Next, he divorced his stepsister, had her exiled, killed, and took her head as a trophy, apparently under Papea's influence. But not to worry, Nero did a 360, turned around, and forward smashed Papea and their unborn child off stage. That's one problem taken care of. Nero went unhinged. He had several close friends and political rivals murdered, had a former slave castrated, then married him, and even had a senator murdered just because his expressions were too boring. Oh, would you look at that? I'm dying now. Okay. But Nero's crowning moment in history comes in the year 64, where he allegedly started a small fire in a suspiciously flammable merchant shop. According to some sources, Nero wanted to make way for a newer, more elegant, and ornate palace. And you know what they say, in order to make an omelette, you have to burn down your city. About 71% of Rome was destroyed in the Great Fire in 64 AD. There's rumors that Nero shredded on the fiddle or loot during all this, but there's no actual proof of that claim. But like, could you imagine? Eventually, Nero's frequent and dangerously wacky antics forced the Senate to declare him a public enemy. But Nero said that he wouldn't be taken alive. And he wasn't. He went from Nero to zero by slamming a knife into his own neck, thus ending his 13-year reign. Talk about a Nero death experience. You may not think it by looking at him, but this tall glass of lukewarm pond water was once the most influential and feared kings in Europe in the late 1400s. This is Ferdinand I of Naples, aka Ferrante. He was the illegitimate son of King Alfonso the Magnanimous of Aragon, not Aragorn. Aragon is over in Spain, Naples is over in Italy, geography. When Alfonso left this mortal coil, Ferdinand inherited the crown at Naples at the age of 35. 
Now listen, if you're gonna control a kingdom, seldom do kind kings succeed. Though he did bring about 20 years of peace and prosperity to his own kingdom, he was cruel and vile to his enemies, which, I mean, makes sense. You can't conquer with forgiveness and love, you would just get conquered yourself. That being the case, Ferdinand got a reputation for being rather ruthless. Basically, if you crossed the guy or got on his bad side, you were marked for an unpleasant death. An example of this was early on in his reign in 1462 when several nobles led a revolt against him, trying to put some ham hock of a human on the throne instead. But Ferdinand put a swift end to that gaggle of rabble rousers and the nobles were put in the corner. After many years of keeping his enemies in check, the Ottoman Empire decided it was time to do Ottoman Empire things and invaded Naples in 1480. The southeast region of Salento fell to the Furniture Empire after a few weeks. This caused Ferdinand to panic and declare that everyone should be all hands on deck to fill the kingdom's coffers to fight back the invading Ottomans, and were eventually successful. But the heavy tax burdens pissed off the no good unthankful nobles. They led yet another rebellion against Ferdinand, to which he said, <laughs> okay, and seized their property and wealth. The nobles gave up yet again, but Ferdinand wanted to put an end to this once and for all. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, you're fucking dead. So Ferdinand set up a meeting to grant the rebels amnesty and forgiveness. At said meeting, a deal was struck and the rebels were quickly forgiven, and also quickly murdered. As a warning to any future conspirators, King Ferdinand had their bodies mummified, stuffed, dressed, and put on display in what he called his Black Museum. Listen here, Ferdinand. I think some things need to change around here. Oh, really? Whew, you know, you're doing such a good job as king. Excuse me while I go and unshit my pants. Ferdinand eventually died of butthole cancer, and Naples fell to the French soon after. Now the title, lame here, isn't what you think it is. Instead of being lame like some dumb nerd, Timor was lame in the sense of being disabled. While committing casual sheep theft, as children do, young Timor took an arrow to the knee and an arrow to the hand, which caused lifelong injury. But do you think being reduced down to the usefulness of a cup of tapioca pudding is gonna stop this future conquering warlord? Definitely not. In fact, little Timor grew up to be an extremely cruel but highly intelligent and effective military tactician. Through his efforts, the Turco-Mongol warlord conquered most of Western and Central Asia, Caucasia, Persia, the Middle East, and parts of South Asia and Eastern Europe by 1404, all while forming an empire to call his own, the Timurid Empire. Not bad for running on a 50% limb deficit. During his conquests, he spread destruction and terror almost everywhere he went, because that's kind of what conquerors do. Remember, real power is taken, not given. Throughout these campaigns, Timur's actions gained him quite an infamous reputation, placing him amongst other horrifying legends. One such action was the Massacre of Isfahan. Formerly a Persian city, Isfahan was a flourishing hub of art, medicine, music, philosophy, and architecture, which men had had wealth. A thriving city is great and all, but when you have no army to defend it, you're basically just begging for a pillaging. Oh no, I hope no one takes my hard-earned money. Ugh, my coins are just spilling out. Please don't plunder me pockets. Is it... is this a sexual thing? It could be. So with little to no defense in place, Timur waltzed right in and was all, This is mine now. And Isfahan was all, Fair enough. Surrendering immediately. As an act of mercy, Timur spared the population, did some light looting, and left some soldiers in command as he went on his next conquest. Well, a few young hooligans decided to be heroes and murder Timur's soldiers. Bad move. Timur caught wind of this and immediately hightailed it back to Isfahan. In a completely level-headed and reasonable response, he ordered the slaughter of every man, woman, and child in the city. He gave each of his soldiers a quota of heads to bring him. If they failed to collect the craniums, they would lose their own noggins to add to the count. One by one, each citizen was cut down. Almost the entire population of 100,000 people, including all livestock, were murdered. Piles of skulls were scattered around the city as testaments to the horrific act. Look, taking your revenge against those who directly defied you is one thing, but when tens of thousands of innocent civilians become collateral damage to your blind wrath, that's when things cross over into evil territory. One surviving prisoner stated that Timor, quote, 
ordered the women and children to be taken to a plane outside the city, and ordered the children under seven years of age to be placed apart, and ordered his people to ride over these same children. When his counselors and the mothers of the children saw this, they fell at his feet and begged that he would not kill them. He would not listen, and ordered that they should be ridden over, but none would be the first to do so. He got angry and rode himself among them, and said, Now I should like to see. Who will not ride after me? Then they were obliged to ride over the children, and they were all trampled upon. There were 7,000. Yeah, Timur was a pretty bad dude, and that's really just one example of his many atrocities. By the time of his death in 1405, it is estimated that Timur's conquest caused the death of over 17 million people, which was about 5% of the world's population at the time. Pretty solid kill streak. The Xia Dynasty, the very first dynasty in ancient China, is estimated to have been founded around 2070 BC and remained in power for several hundreds of years until this guy showed up. King Jie was the last ruler of the Xia dynasty, which most certainly means that he royally fudged up in some shape or form. So what happened? Not surprisingly, Jie had a reputation as a cruel tyrant. He was the big cheese around these parts and he wanted everyone to know that at all times. But you could argue that Jie was ahead of his time, because instead of focusing on ways to better his empire, like any good emperor would, he only sought ways to make life better for himself and his closest buddies, like modern politicians. He also loved spending money. Tons of it. He would drain the kingdom's coffers on frivolous activities like luxurious palace upgrades, <coughs> endless entertainment, <coughs> and smashing some gash with the royal concubines. <coughs> when he ran out of money, he would either raise taxes to continue to fund his lifestyle, or randomly invade small neighboring towns to relieve them of their hard-earned money and their women. On one particularly lucrative expedition, Jie decided to ravage the local Yu Shi clan. Open up, Yu Shi. I know you're in there. Oh, sorry. Wrong clan. There we go. The Yu Shi clan didn't want to put up a fight because they knew they would get their shit kicked in, so they instantly surrendered. As you can see, they were pretty smart. The clan offered up a substantial bounty of riches for King Jie to hit the road. But since the king had a boner for spilling blood, he felt flaccid and defeated by an enemy who quickly gave up without a fight. Before King Jie could act, the chief of the Yu Shi clan offered one more prize a beautiful woman by the name of Moshi. Enamored by her obvious beauty, King Jie swiftly accepted the offer. I love you. <laughs> Jie became unhealthily obsessed with Moshi, trying anything and everything to please her. He once had servants dig a lake and fill it with wine so the couple could bathe, drink, and flop around on and in each other. I mean, the lake was just full of completely disgusting fluids. Now that it was properly flavored, 3,000 men were then commanded to drink the lake dry. They drowned. After learning that his nearest, dearest, darlingest love weirdly enjoyed the ASMR pleasures of tearing silk, he demanded that the finest silks from the farthest reaches of the kingdom be brought before him so he could rip them for her. All of these dumbass endeavors continued to clear out the kingdom's already scant reserves, so it was time to fundraise. Okay, fellas, taxes are going up again. What the fuck, GA? We can't afford to live like this. You don't understand. I'm this close to getting her to notice me. Stop being a simp. All right, that guy? Someone kill that guy. <laughs> You're still a simp, you know. I know. Basically, over the next several years, all the pissed off and neglected subjects and neighbors started feeling pissed off and neglected. So they turned their attention to a newer, cooler guy. Instead of Jie of Xia, now they wanted Tang of Shang. How funny is that? After many years of gaining political power and support around the country, Tang of Shang built an army, revolted, and eventually defeated and captured King Jie, stripping him of his kingship. Around 1600 BC, the Xia dynasty had fallen. After about 500 years of rule, Jie eventually died of natural causes as a penniless commoner. Evil can be subjective. What could be viewed as an act of evil by one group may be celebrated and revered by another. For instance, Vlad the Impaler's cruel acts of, well, impaling 20,000 people may be seen as wicked and sadistic by most. But to Romanians, he's seen as a hero because he defended his homeland from the invading Ottoman Empire. 
But then there's just completely unjustifiable evil assholes, like King Leopold II of Belgium. What do you think of when you think of Belgium? Waffles? Chocolate? Well, how about indigenous genocide? Yeah, in case you didn't know, the Belgian crown was once in possession of one of, if not the, bloodiest European colonies in African history. At the Berlin Conference in 1884, King Leopold II sought to expand his fortune by staking claim to the Congo, over 900,000 square miles of African rainforest in the present-day Democratic Republic of the Congo. To sweeten the deal, Leo formed the International African Association under the guise that it was for humanitarian and philanthropic purposes, also to establish free trade between the European countries, which was the real selling point. With that, the other colonizing European countries of France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Portugal, and the United Kingdom welcomed Belgium's claim to the land, and King Leopold II was now the sole owner of the ironically named Congo Free State. But there was nothing free about it. King Leo's only interest was to extract as much resources and wealth from the land by any means necessary. In order to do that, he needed manpower. So he forced new laws on the Congolese chieftains to implement within their own communities. Those who resisted were swiftly eradicated by other Congolese communities who were backed by the Belgian crown. Initial collection and trade of precious ivory exports weren't the best for profit margins, so not as much money was being made as expected, causing the colony to fall into massive debt. But with the invention and development of automobiles in the late 1800s, the demand for tires shot through the thatched roof. In order to make tires, you need rubber. Lots of rubber. Where does rubber come from? Rubber trees. And boy, let me tell you that the Congo had some rubber trees. After establishing his own personal African army called the Force Publique to enforce rule, King Leo extracted a fortune through blood. Millions of Congolese natives were enslaved and forced to harvest and process rubber from the Congo with the main goal of maximizing production at all costs. Those who were unable to meet a labor quota were sometimes murdered on the spot. Those who refused to work were savagely beaten with their villages raided and destroyed. This system, called the Red Rubber System, led to the utter collapse of the Congolese economy and culture. It should be noted that King Leo never stepped foot in the Congo himself. He left all of his dirty work to hand-picked Belgian officials who ruled as they pleased, often contributing their own atrocities against the native people. One particularly nasty official was Leon Fieves. He was notorious for punishing underperforming slaves by having their hands cut off. He claimed that it was a way to settle the debt of labor owed to him. The false public soldiers were in charge of collecting these debts, and they were even rewarded for the amount of hands they could collect. With that mentality, they would often resort to cutting the hands off of working slaves to cheat the system. This actually ended up pissing the king off because how the hell are slaves supposed to work with no hands? There were several other issues that plagued the Congo as a direct result of Belgian brutality. All of the development and forced labor caused the vast majority of farming to come to a dead halt, leading to extreme famine and even more deaths. Children who were orphaned during the colonization were kidnapped and forced into Catholic schools where they would learn to work or be soldiers. Fatal diseases ran rampant through the Congo, including smallpox, amoebic dysentery, and the parasitic trypanosomiasis, also called the sleeping sickness, which caused mass insomnia and painful muscle spasms. Through the culmination of these atrocities, historians estimate that roughly 5 to 10 million Congolese people lost their lives during Belgium's reign over the Congo from 1885 to 1908. Thanks to missionaries who secretly documented these atrocities, the public was informed of the horrors of the Congo. The Belgian public, who had no knowledge of these actions, caused an uproar. After much public outcry around the world, including famous writers like Mark Twain and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the Belgian parliament forced King Leopold II to cede the Congo Free State to Belgium itself in 1908, but not before he could destroy any and all documented evidence of his wrongdoings that he could find. The Congo Free State was changed to the Belgian Congo, then the Republic of the Congo, then the Democratic Republic of the Congo, since its western neighbor had the same name. King Leopold died a year later in 1909, and the public dunked on his funeral with loud booing and heckling. 
Even today, many Belgians are ashamed of their late monarch's atrocious behavior and demonstration of how evil a human could be. Fun stuff, right? Here's another video.